Yep, here, you want to take and go throw this away for me? Thank you, sir. So as they're heading downstairs, we will open up with, let's grab our sword. Let's go to battle. Well, Father God, we come to you now. We're victorious in your word, victorious in your promises, and victorious, Father God, because we have you in our heart. Lord, we give all things and we give all glory to you. And we ask that you would be with us steadfast, anchored, because you keep us here, Father God, doing what you have called us to do. We will continue until you call us home. In Jesus' name we all say, Amen. Amen. Thoughtful entanglements might sound a little deceiving, right? How many of you have ever spent your life trying to get someone to approve of what you're doing, of how you live, how you think, how you act? Right? Anybody with me? Yeah? All right? Good. Three of us. Nice. What is that called? It's called what? No, not codependency. <laughs> it's called what? People pleasing. Okay? And, and people pleasing is a well-worn scheme and a trap of who? The enemy. Right? If we think people-pleasing began with self-esteem training, the tolerance movement, or social media, we have underestimated how interwoven this temptation has been with humanity. The sin of people-pleasing is as old as human history. Think back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Really, they didn't know what they were doing when they took of the apple, but their eyes were opened, and so they had a much broader understanding of themselves. And so they hid, and they were doing things that were unpleasing, right? Because they were trying to please one another with knowledge. Well, since the fall, we have been tempted to live our praise and approval of others. Man has always fallen into the fear of man. Our stubborn, often subtle weaknesses for the esteem of others has roots that stretch far and wide. In society, in history, and too often it is found within us, right? And God hates people pleasing. Here, the apostle, the apostle warns in Galatians 1.10. In Galatians 1.10 it says, I am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 1 Thessalonians 2.4, it says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people but God who tests our hearts. Jesus put his finger on the ancient fear of man when he confronted the proud people pleasers of his day. In John 5:44. In John 5:44 he said, "How can you believe since you accepted glory from one another but not seek the glory that comes from the only God. People pleasing. 
It had blinded them to Jesus. See, they were so bent up on the rules and regulations that they weren't looking at the true meaning of the words. They, they're so smart that sometimes they were just really stupid, right? Because, I mean, how many of you have really overthought something, overlooked the obvious that was in the word, you know, or maybe it was a problem you did in school and, and you just put way too much into it. You know, I would do that sometimes. You know, when the teacher gave us instructions, I would look at the instructions and I would get overwhelmed. But the answer was typically always right there within the question. All you had to do was slow down, stop overthinking it, stop making it more than what it was, and the answer would be right there in front of you. Well, I think the Pharisees of the old were so bent on the rules and regulations that they weren't taking the word and breaking the word down. They weren't taking the teachings and diving in and dissecting. They were just going by, you know, the rule. This is the rule. This is what we're to do, right? That's what blinded them to Jesus. And if we don't put it in check, if we don't check ourselves, it will cover our eyes as well. John 12, 43. John 12, 43, it says, For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Ouch. You know what this tells me? more than glory that comes from God, that preference is the essence and danger of people-pleasing. I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing a good job for my boss. Right? You know, because if I'm doing a good job, they're most likely going to give me a raise. Hallelujah. Who doesn't need a raise up in this place? Things that are going on in our life and we need to separate what we're trying to do for them and make sure that we are doing for God as well. So how do we kill people pleasing? How do we expose our pronenesses to people pleasing and begin putting it to death? Paul confronts particular temptation head on in two remarkable uh similar passages if you turn your bibles to ephesians 6 5 through 9 ephesians 5 6 5 through 9 it says slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey christ obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you but as slaves of christ doing the will of god from your heart Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each, of one, each one for whatever good they do. Whatever they are, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. And then Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Basically, we're repeating the same thing. Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. You ever heard about bond servants in the Bible? There's a, there's a whole Christian, you know, uh, motorcycle group, and they're called bond slaves, right? 
and they've read these passages, and this is where they want their lives to be known for. Yes, we are all slaves to something. Right? I mean, we might not think of ourselves as a slave. It's like, well, I'm an employee. Yeah, but you're a slave to something. You're, you're doing something for something. That's basically the, the uh, breakdown of slavery is I'm working for someone to receive something. Right? Slavery was they basically worked for their master to receive something. And so bond servants, they obey in everything those who are your earthly masters do by your way of eye service as people pleasers. Do away. The Apostle Paul calls servants to relate to their masters in countercultural ways. Despite what they may be suffering and enduring, <laughs> he admonishes, however, apply far beyond masters and servants. What he, what he admonishes, sorry. To the bosses and employees, hands and husbands and wives, parents and children, friends and neighbors. The two passages are several sentences in a textbook on how to resist people pleasing in any relationship, including at least five important lessons. Number one, love with fear and trembling. Bond servants obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Now, I know if you were looking at slaves back then, it was like, how can I really serve with sincerity of heart when there's a whip being snapped across my back, right? Well, the Bible is clear on that. We are to love our enemies. Amen? And loving your enemies might even be having to love that grumpy old boss of yours. Right? The antidote to fear of man is not fearlessness, but a better, healthier, more life-giving fear, a fear of God. To avoid people-pleasing... We must love people with fear and trembling toward God. Much of our captivity to the feelings and desires of others stems from our relative indifference to the eyes and heart of heaven. We've developed a devastating allergy <laughs> to trembling. I don't think we remember how to tremble with fear before God. I think we have forgotten that God is almighty. He is all powerful. You know, he is the creator of the universe, right? I mean, he had our, our DNA designed before we were ever even thought of. Amen? Psalms 96.9. It says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Man, I guarantee you, if all people on this planet were to recognize and know the strength and the power of Christ Almighty, and we were to just get down on our knees and beg for forgiveness and tremble before the Lord, what a wonderful and glorious and magnificent place this would be. But whose responsibility is to get every ear to hear? Each and every one of us, right? Right? It says we are to be the gospel, the living word. Paul makes the same point in Colossians 3.22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eyes are on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. If we were to work our daily lives as though we were in the presence of Christ Almighty, how much better would our lives possibly be? Can you imagine that with me? Exponentially better. Magnanimously better. How many of us fear the disappointment or disapproval of others more than we fear displeasing God? 
right? I mean, I think sometimes we get so caught up in this, in this socialistic thinking that, you know what, I've got to be something for society. I've got to look a certain way. I've got to act a certain way. I've got to talk a certain way. I've got to have certain things. Or I'm not going to be accepted in society. Why are we so worried about that? Alexander the Great came back from a, a battle one time. And I just saw this last night, and it reminded me. And there's a gentleman that lives within outside the city gates. And I forget his name, but uh, they called him the dog. This was a gentleman that decided to live his life without any of life's uh, luxuries. You know, I mean, he, he barely had clothes on his body. And he lived in an old barrel. And he was given the food by those who might be passing by and have something left over. And he was happy that way. And Alexander the Great came through, was getting ready to come through the gates. And all the guards, you know, make way, Alexander the Great, blah, 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 you know. And pushing people aside. And Alexander the Great come up and he introduced himself. He said, hi, I'm Alexander the Great. And this guy said, I am the dog. And he said, don't you fear me? And he says, why should I fear you? You have nothing for me to fear. I have nothing for you to take. And then Alexander, one of his men said, shall we put him in prison? Shall we behead him? And Alexander was like, no. He said, even though I am Alexander the Great, lest my life be known as Alexander the Great, I would much rather be the dog. Right? This gentleman wasn't out to please anybody. He was out to just live his life the way that he desired to live his life. Alexander the Great chose to live his life the way that he chose to live his life. But he said, if it wasn't for me being appointed and put into this position, much my life would be best to live as the dog. Subjecting our fears of one another to a greater fear of God will over time clarify and purify our motivations in relationships. Instead of constantly worrying what others might think or how they might respond we need to spend more time meditating on the holiness, the justice, and the mercy of God. Number two, always do what God says to do. Obey. I know that's a bad word in today's society. It's been a bad word for a long time. Obey. Right? When, when his word says, just obey me, people are like, eh. I want to believe, I believe in what you say, but now you're asking me to obey? Yeah, you're stretching it, right? But if we're believing it, should we not obey it? I mean, you know, just because I know the speed limit is 55 or 65, does that really mean I have to obey it? Well, no, I don't, but there's consequences if I don't, right? If I don't obey the speed limit, what's my consequences? I can get a ticket. You get too many tickets, you get your license taken away from you. Right? Same thing with God's word. If we're not willing to just believe and obey it, there's consequences in the end for what we will receive. I would much rather give up a little time of obedience than to spend eternity in the alternative place hell amen right obey not by the way of eye service as people pleasers but as bond servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart ephesians 6 6 it says obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from 
your heart. If we're not willing to put our heart in it, then guess what? It's absolutely useless in doing it. Amen? This lesson in exhortation may seem to, to be simple and practical and helpful. Resolve to do what God says to do. Do the will of God. That's a simple practice. It's a simple lesson. I think it's practical and helpful for each and every one of us to remember. Do the will of God. Before we do something, we should be asking, is this the will of God in my life? Is this what he desires for me to do? The people pleaser desperately chases the wills of other people. We know each and every one of them. We call those what? Keeping up with the Joneses or the Kardashians, whatever. I don't care what you call them. We spend too much of our time trying to chase after the glory and the magnificentness of others. Right? We should have a God-fearing focus on discerning and pursuing the will of God. Come on. Well, yes, but how do we know what the will of God is in any given situation? Well, Paul answers that question with surprisingly, surprising clarity and simplification. Simplicity. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Imagine that. That you should avoid sexual immorality. Imagine that. Right? God's will is that we should be found in Him, not in ourselves. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. If we're following God's will, then we don't have to worry about the rest, do we? Right? I mean, is it natural for, you know, after you learned how to drive a car, it's pretty natural for you to get in and know what to do, isn't it? Right? And most of us have had a vehicle long enough to where we can know where all the buttons and switches and everything is at without even looking. Right? If we were diving into God's word as, as much as we should, we would automatically, it would just be natural for us to flow in that obedience, to flow in God's will, to know that we, it's God's will for us to be sanctified. It's, it's his pleasure to let us know that we are a free-thinking people, that we have our own wills, but he has a will to sanctify us, to free us from those bonds that enslave us, and they hold us down, and they hold us back. When you're confronted with decisions, one good question to ask is this. What choice will this cause for me? And if it's going to take me more, uh, take me further away from Jesus. What cause and will will this do to me if it takes me away from Jesus? What would make me really rely on God? What would help bring others closer to him? What would bring him the most glory? Many decisions, however, are not as black and white as we would like them, are they? Right? I mean, I know a lot of black and white people in my life. Got some of them. Yeah, and <laughs> I didn't ask for hands to be raised, but, you know, I saw one go up. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your clarity. Thank you for your honesty. All right, but listen. There, there's a lot of things that we have in our life, a lot of decisions that we should be relying more on God with than we rely on our own thinking. I know I can tell you what, I'm honest, and I'll tell you, I've screwed up a lot of things and messed up a lot of things because I thought it my way and didn't stop and say, all right, God, I need your help on this because I'm treading into waters that I don't know. You know, typically, there isn't a manifestly Jesus path 
and a manifestly sinful path. You know, if it was that clear, if, they, if, the, if there were signs, you know, this is the way Jesus is gone and this is the way sin is gone, you know, I think maybe we would avoid going down that path. But there's not, is there? We have to tread these roads. We have to tread these grounds. and We have to treat them with respect. And, you know, we can make anything and anywhere we are at holy ground by doing what? Let's pray over it first. Let's give this situation, let's get clarity and understanding before we even step out the door. Right? God, go before me in every situation. Either open hearts, open eyes, change thoughts and directions before I even get there. Right? I, I, we've prayed that, and I tell you what, it's a magnificent prayer to pray. Because there are times we were walking into situations that we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And before we even got there, God had already spoke to their hearts and their minds. And it turned out to be magnificent. We had a great time. When we were so worried that it was going to be... sanctification, holiness, Paul also says this, Romans 12, 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed. There's only one way that I could have been transformed from my old life to this new life. And that was by getting into God's word, by studying it, by making sure I understood what I was reading. Get a concordance, right? Get a Bible dictionary. Get a commentary. I tell you what, there's a whole lot smarter people that have gone before me that have done a lot of work. And I tell you what, they can help you get a better, clearer understanding of what the Word is saying in your life. I wish the Pharisees would have had that. I, maybe not. But we could always have prayed, Father God, open their eyes and their ears. You know, I think we have Pharisees today that need their eyes opened to the clarity and understanding of God's Word. Instead of thinking they're all intelligent, Maybe they need to understand that they're just a bunch of dorks like the rest of us. Right? Sorry if I called you a dork. Sorry, not sorry. Listen. God fears listen as carefully as possible to all that God says in his word. Meditating on it day and night. Psalms 1 through 12. It says that. And then they strive to obey to the best of their knowledge and their ability. I'm telling you what, my ability sometimes falls short. Because I'm so caught up in who I'm trying to make happy. Well, I got this going on in my life, but somebody called and I need to go do this. Now I'm over here doing this. Well, somebody else it needs this. So now I'm over here doing this. You know, we run ourselves ragged because we're so consumed with what others might think or say. Come on. None of us will know all that God wants and commands at all times. But we can commit to do at all times, what we do know he has said to do. I remember that time when God asked me to do something. I was scared witless. Lord, you know, you know who these people are. You know what they could do to me. Yeah, I know. But I want you to go tell him I love him. But Lord, I'm with my children. Yeah, I know. I just want you to go tell him I love him. But Father, come on. Really? Is this going to be my last meal? It might be, but I just want you to go tell him I love him. 
And that's the day I walked up to a biker, tapped him on the back, looked him straight in the eye, and told him, God loves you. And I went back to my seat as quickly as I could and sat down. Right? Face down, mouth on my cheeseburger, like, this is it. I'm going to die today, you know? But I did what God told me to do. I, I was reluctant, you know? I, I threw my fleeces out there, you know? Really? You want my children to be fatherless, you know? But when I looked up, that man was crying. I didn't know what was going on in his life. We don't need to know. I don't need to be a people pleaser. I need to be obedient to what God says. Who knows what's going on in that man's life? He needed to know. God loves you. When God says to do it, he says to jump. He says to move. What should we be doing? We should be jumping. We should be moving. We should be running in that direction. Regardless of the danger, regardless of who we're trying to make happy, regardless of the people around us, what they might be saying or not saying. Oh, don't go there. It ain't going to do you no good. Shut up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Be quiet. I ain't even hearing that. Right? You don't know my God. God's called me over here. I'm going there. Right? But you're not equipped. I don't need to be equipped. He's the equipper. He'll give me what I need when I get there. I just need to know that I got to go. But you ain't, got, you ain't got the schooling. I don't need the schooling. I got the Bible. I got God's word. But, but, but. No, don't butt me. Get your butt out of the way, because I'm going. Amen? <laughs> Three, sacrifice the safety of superficiality. Obey in everything, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. You know, a long time ago, we, uh, we had, in our men's group, we had this thing that we were talking about, and it was uh, intentional acts of service. Doing things because God has said to do them without people knowing that we were doing them because God's called us to do that thing. Right? And I don't need a pat on the back. I don't need a dollar in my pocket. I just need to know if God's called me to go to your yard and mow your lawn, that guess what? If it wakes you up in the morning and I'm out mowing your lawn, just go on back to sleep. Just know that we got it taken care of. Amen? Intentional acts of service. That's exactly what he was calling his people to do. Work for me, not for them. You might be employed by them, but you're working as though you were working for me. Do what I have called you to do. Be who I've called you to be and guarantee you I will set you free. Come on. The sin of people pleasing almost by definition presumes duplicity. If, if we're constantly angling to do what pleases others, it is almost impossible to remain consistent or maintain integrity, especially if we're trying to please several people at once. <laughs> that means one way we battle people pleasing is to prize and protect sincerity. Do we alter ourselves before certain people in order to make or keep them happy? I think we all, we've all been guilty of that, right? Just give them the donut. Just give them the pickle. You know, you've heard that. If you've ever been in customer relations, you've heard, just give them the pickle. Right? Just make them happy. I don't want to make them happy. It's wrong. They're taking money out of your, out of your store. Just give them the pickle. Just make them happy. So you're telling me I need to, I need to do this instead of doing what's right. Yeah. Oh, it's your money, not mine. Do we alter ourselves before certain people in order to make or keep them happy? 
I, I think as a parent, I've done that several times. Right? When you got a crying, screaming kid, you don't know what to do, and you're at home alone, and you're like, you ain't got no cell phone, you ain't got no contact, you know, and it's five hours before your wife gets home, and you got a screaming kid, you're like, what do I do? What do you want? So you start running through your gambits until you find something that makes the kid happy, no matter how tired you are. Do we act or speak a certain way to fit in with one crowd and then transform ourselves to fit in somewhere else? Oh, yeah. I've seen a many a churchgoers do this. Oh, they praise the Lord on Sunday. They give all the glory to God on Sunday. Come Monday through Friday, they're living like hell. Right? You, you, you run into them out in, in the street and they're cussing and swearing, smoking, and drinking. You know, I'm not condoning those things, but sometimes we just get a little out of control. Amen? Where's your filter? I ain't got no filter. I'm filterless. That's why you talk like an old seaman. Anyway. Insecurity camouflages weakness and establishes its strength in people. When we're in, unsecure, when, we, when we're unsure of ourselves, it, it causes us to, to think that people are thinking different about us, right? I mean, we should all be so confident to know that we are of royal blood. Amen? You know, that there, there, there should be no Christian who believes in the Bible out there running around thinking that they got to please somebody because somebody said something bad about them. I don't care what you say about me. Go on ahead and talk behind my back. God hears it. You're going to have to answer for that someday. Right? We should just be doing what God has called us to do. Doing what God has called us to do. And it sure ain't people pleasing, is it? <laughs> he didn't say, you know what, I want you to go to the rich and the famous, you know, and blend in with them. And then somehow, some way, slip in the gospel. You know? When we're unsure of ourselves, it hides secret sins and parades virtues. It's self protective, self uh, congratulating, and always projecting. The call to sincerity is the call to put off. And forsake all superficiality. Drop those rocks. Get rid of that weight. Cut it loose. Right? Be happy with who you are. You know? I think that's part of the big problem. With people pleasing. Is I'm not happy with me. But if I can make somebody else happy, that makes me happy. That's wrong thinking, right? The Bible clearly states that a house divided cannot stand. And he says you are to love yourself before you love your neighbor, right? I can't make my neighbor happy if I'm not happy. If I don't know how to make myself happy, I can't make them happy because all I'm doing is servicing something inside of them that I'm not willing to do for myself. No one believer or otherwise wants to be known as superficial. So why do so many of us still fall into this trap? In part, because superficiality makes us feel safe. It makes us feel important. And it makes some of us feel successful. If we can project the image of others we love and admire, then we will be loved and admire, so we think. Right? I mean, what is a chameleon best known for? Changing. Changing his color. You know, an octopus takes it even further than that. They don't just change their color. They can change the way that they look. They can mimic fish. They can mimic rocks. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes we're just like that. 
We think if I take this little bit from this person, a little bit from that person, you know, that's, that's famous or rich or, or popular, you know, that people are going to view me in the same manner. They're going to they're gonna look at me the same way when they're just looking at you going, you're never going to be like that person. So why are you trying? Monkey see, monkey do. Why don't you be you, right? The problem, of course, is that we and God know who we really are behind all the elaborate costumes and performances. You can't fool God. You can't. No matter how clever you try to disguise yourself, no matter how whimsical you try to sound, you're never going to fool God. So why try? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. And so whoever the, whoever the people love, it is not really us they're loving. Just like I said. Sincerity, not superficiality, is the sure path to peace, love, purpose, and freedom. Sincerity. Number four, obey God in public and in secret. Here's that word obey again. I'm so sorry. Not sorry. With a sincere heart, you are to obey Christ, not by the way of eye service. This test may be the most immediately enlightening, not by the way of eye service, or not only when others are watching, especially the particular people whose approval or praise we crave. This point overlaps with the previous one, but processes, processes, sorry, on the difference between our public self and our secret self. Who we are when we are alone. Who are you when you are alone? Are you the same person you are in public, or are you the same person you are in secret? I've lived a secret life for a long time. Right? Not allowing people to know how it made me feel. I have a, I have a real insecurity that I carry in front of me. It's my belly. Right? I'm not proud of it. I don't want it. But people seem to find a way to come up and they'll rub it and ask me when I'm due and pat it. It bothers me. That's my secret self. But I don't show them that it bothers me. I just laugh it off. And I go on. But deep down inside it does hurt. Right? Because I'm not used to being this. This is not who I, I, that's the first thing, I created myself to be. Before I got into my car accident, I had maybe 8 to 10% body fat. I was a weightlifter. I was constantly running, exercising. I was very militant minded. But then I got into a car accident, and maybe that's God's way of saying, you know what, I need to take something away from you because you were a little over secure about yourself, a little too prideful about yourself. And I have to, I have to come to grips with that and understand that, you know what, he's kept me from being someone that I was turning into. One of those people that I always said I didn't like. Who are you in society? One of the surest ways to forfeit our souls is to use God merely to garner attention and applause for ourselves. I know a lot of big Christians, a lot of big name Christians that do that. They all sound holier than thou. And they're as fake, they're as fake as Betty Crocker. <laughs> Right? I mean, they're like a box cake. It ain't homemade. It might taste homemade, but it ain't homemade. Well, I made it at home. Yeah, but you bought it from a store. <laughs> it was already put together for you. All you had to do was add water. I know a lot of Christians that are like that. Box Christians. You know, looks good on the outside, but deep down on the inside, they're tore up from the floor up. They're not sincere. They're not true. They're hypocrites. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be truthful. 
uh, I want to be forefront, you know. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'll be the first one to stand up here and admit I have faults. I have problems. I have issues. But I know who I can take them to. Amen? That cuts the difference between all the rest. One of the surest ways to forfeit our souls is to use God merely to garner attention and applause for ourselves. Beware. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Jesus warns us, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Man, I feel sorry for those people that are doing that. I truly feel sorry for them. They will not reap the same reward that the rest of us are going to reap. Amen? These are hypocrites. This is what Jesus said. He said, the hypocrites, he says, announce themselves when they give to the needy or pay or pray or fast that they may be praised by others. Did anybody see me give tithe today? No, because I didn't. Right? So I can't get praised for that. Amen? Amen? When I'm praying in a restaurant, I don't, you know, do it so loud that the whole restaurant shuts up. Right? I do it loud enough to where the people at my table can hear it, maybe the people next to us. I don't do it on purpose for them to hear, but I do it so I can hear because I'm deaf. Amen? Right? Does anybody know how many people I've baptized in the last?
We're back from commercial break. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Number five, seek your reward from God. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Hallelujah. Right? I know, I know this word. You know this word. But are we truly living this word? Are we truly thinking about it this way? What I am doing here, regardless of what I say or do, if I'm doing it as though I am working for the Lord, I will receive my reward in heaven. Right? I don't need, I don't need it now. I don't need it now. I want it then. Amen? People pleasers may enjoy the pleasures of earthly praise, but only to the expense of a heavenly reward. Every time we prefer the glory of man to the glory of God, we believe the terrifying lie that the stray crumbs of human praise will be more satisfying than the wedding feast that awaits us. Ouch. Any of you ever went to a wedding feast? Like a really good wedding feast? Like, you know, you walk in and, and the table is set and you're like, dang. Right? It's like, they got some stuff. You know, and you're looking at the big wedding cake in the middle of the table, and you're like, wow, that looks delicious. Can you imagine? It says, in, in science facts, it says, if we were to take the most pleasurable thing we can think of in the world and multiply it 10 million by 10 million by 10 million times, it's kind of, that's what it's going to kind of be like in heaven. It's unfathomable, right, to think that way. Man, I can't wait to get to heaven and taste that food. Woo! I bet you God's a better barbecuer than I am. Amen? Guarantee it. I guarantee it, Justin Williams. Praise God. Against the tragedy of people-pleasing, hypocrisy, Jesus encourages us. When you give to the needy, or pray, or fast, or love one another, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Here again, intentional acts of service. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Hallelujah. We cannot measure the worth of this reward. For those who live to please God will not withhold any gift or pleasure. Hallelujah. Romans 8.32. I promise I'm getting close to closing. Romans 8.32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Man, that's something to think about, isn't it? I mean, God was God gave His Son the 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 prized possession of His life, and He says He's got more better things in store for us. Wow, really? Are you serious? <laughs> that reminds me, we went to. Uh, while we were down in Oklahoma, we went to this little restaurant. It's called uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's a play on the, you know, the real Breakfast at Tiffany's. And so we're looking through the menu, and, you know, it, this is uh, in celebration of Johnny's birthday. So on his birthday, he would usually go out for a chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes, and a Pepsi. Okay? I had everything but the Pepsi. I can't stand the taste of Pepsi. All right? I had a tea. No, I, what did I have? Yeah, I think I had a sweet tea. Anyway, so we ordered the chicken fried steak. And so we asked the guy, you know, and you know how some people are. It's like, how big is your chicken fried steak? Oh, it's big. Right? So we asked the guy, well, how big is your chicken fried steak? He says, it's pretty good size. Yeah, really? Are you kidding me? He brought that thing out, and I took a picture of it, and I think I posted it on Facebook. 
My hand only covered half of that chicken fry. And I had my hand spread out like this. And it only covered half of that chicken fried steak. The other, it went all the way around like that. When he brought it out, <laughs> those were John Edwards' words. She goes, are you kidding me? Are you serious right now? <laughs> it was like, holy cow. I probably ate like that much of it. You know, I mean, as big as it was, it was like that thick, almost like a half an inch thick. I was like, man, that's a chicken fried steak right there, right? It could have fed the whole village. Listen, whatever we receive and experience in the new world God gives to us, no reward, no accomplishments or approval could ever have made us happier, right? As big as that chicken fried steak was, I guarantee you the one in heaven is probably bigger than that. Amen? And tastier. Hallelujah. Yeah, because it was a good chicken fried steak, man. That was probably one of the best chicken fried steaks I ever had. And I I like chicken fried steak. We We starve the craving for the praise and the approval of people by striving for what we can get only from God. Please, God, love people. Love people, love God. Right? Simple. Simple. All right. Now, pleasing God does not mean despising people. Okay? So, the Son of God himself came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many did it say just a certain group did it say just a particular person no it said for many for all is the representation of many he counted others and their interests more significant than his own imagine that he thought of us before he thought of himself he said by this all people will know that you are my disciples If you have love for one another, do we love one another in this building? Come on. Amen. Pleasing God does not release us from relentlessly and significantly loving people. It does release us from the tyranny of needing their praise or fearing their rejection. Right? Somebody don't like what you say, just look at them and say, you know what, that's all right. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Look at their response. (laughs) Huh? What? You what? Who's Jesus? Oh, let me tell you about Jesus. I'm glad you asked. Right? That might be an open door policy. So pleasing God and loving people like Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Worrying about how well he will be received or remembered by men, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Do all that you do before his loving, watchful, fearsome eyes. If we learn to rejoice and tremble before him, the seduction of people-pleasing will wither and die. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come to you in your glorious name. Let us not keep our eyes on the the civility of man, but let's turn our gaze heavenly. Let's look for your face. Let's look for your hand. Let's look for that opportunity to reach out and touch someone again and again and again. Give us a better understanding, Father God, of how and what and where we are to be and place us there. Let us be obedient because obedience leaves, lives or leads to longevity. It leads to eternity. Hallelujah. I want to be caught up in eternity. I don't know about you, but I do know about me. Lord, I need you more and more every day. Every breath I take, every heartbeat I make, Father God, let it be of you. Let every thought, 
be captivated. Let every entanglement be untangled. Let there be no knots in our lives. Let us live our lives according to your glorious and magnificent will. Let us know and understand, Father God, that you desire us to have more. Your will is for us to be reconciled to you, to be delivered. Your desire is for us to, to be free. Let us not squander this gift that we have been freely given. And let us not forget whom the giver is that gave it. Father, glorify your people today. Manifest your spirit in their life today. Open their hearts and their eyes today. Lord, I pray over each and every person. And I ask, Father God, that you would bless them. If there is anything you need prayer for, today, come up. If you want anointing, come up. This altar is open to each and every one of you. Family, we're here for one another. Because God was here for us first. He made it all. He's done it all. He's seen it all. He's heard it all. Don't think that what you got inside of you, he don't know. He knows it all. And he wants to touch you today, to free you today. That's his will. That's his way. That's his desire. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you for manifesting your spirit upon us today, opening our hearts and our eyes today. And Father, we give ourselves unto you today. In the name of Jesus, we all say, amen. Hey, if you don't hear it any well, you're going to hear it right here. God loves you and amen, we do.